Hi, I'm Ron Vanderlinden, linebacker coach at Penn State University. This DVD contains the drills, fundamentals, and techniques I use to coach the linebackers here at Penn State University. You'll also see corresponding game tape of each drill used in the course of a game. All athletic skills begin with a stance. If the stance is flawed, the opportunity for success in that particular play decreases. A linebacker should have his feet no wider than his shoulders. He should uh, have his head and eyes up. He should have his knees over his feet and his shoulders over his knees. If, you're, if your stance is too wide, you can't help but take a balance step in, which creates a crossover step, which keeps you from getting to the ball as quickly as you possibly could. It costs you a step and a half as you pursue the football, and it also straightens your body up. And if you were to take on a blocker when you were in a crossover position, uh, you would lose your base and, and be very ineffective as you would take on a blocker or a ball carrier. This is the exact position you want to maintain throughout the six to eight second course of the play. This is the position you want to meet the ball carrier in when you tackle the ball carrier. Anything less than that position is ideal, is less than ideal. It will not put you in the most advantageous position to make a physical tackle, driving the ball carrier back, keeping the ball carrier from getting post contact yardage. Um, uh, so often during the course of a season, there's so little time to work agility drills and reaction drills, and they are important. I think the most important skill for a linebacker is the shuffle and to change direction. I do a form of, of a shuffle drill each and every day, including pregame. Now in this drill here, I'm just working, uh, changing reaction, opening the hips, getting depth in the pass game, breaking up on a draw or a quarterback scramble. And I think there's a start in, in every play in football and there's a finish. And the most critical, the most important part of the play is the finish. And that's when a linebacker or a defender would put the ball on the ground. Each player, as you, should see, as you can see, should regain his balance, should pit, fit perfectly within his relationship to the football. If you're an apex player, you should hit it right down the edge. If, if you're a curl defender, you should fit side to side. I'm sorry, foot to foot with the other curled defender, keeping the ball in your inside shoulder. And if you're contained position, you should say square. The player uh, to my far left has his shoulders turned, which is less than ideal. He should stay square, and you should fit. In this position, you can react to whatever the ball carrier does and make solid contact. Oftentimes in working uh, agility drills, I'm going to work them uh, downhill, where they're pressing the football and actually getting the players to, to attack downhill. The, the shuffle should be a reach slide motion. You're going to see the shuffle and the importance in game footage now. Just about every play uh, that you would watch Penn State play, you should see all three linebackers in that stance position start to finish and incorporate the shuffle. Watch 31. The stance should be perfect, and then note that if he, he's in that perfect position when contact is made on the ball carrier. And you can see the change in direction in the shuffle. Watch number 31 again and also number 40. Utilizing the shuffle technique. Thirty-one again, forty. As I watch game tape, I always try to 
duplicate in practice what I'm seeing our linebackers do and need to do to be successful on game footage. I think so often coaches will do drills to do drills and they don't have great sense of purpose. If you can't see your drills on game taped, then I think you're doing the wrong drills. See uh, 45 changing direction, having to hit, shuffle, uh, stun, which we'll get to in a second. Number 40, shuffling. And again, really, you should see all three linebackers incorporate the shuffle, change of direction, and then other techniques that we'll get to uh, as we get through the tape. When defeating a blocker, there's a progression of, of fundamentals that take place. The first fundamental is I should attack with my hands. My elbows should be in and my thumbs should be up. I'm not going to stop the charge of an offensive lineman or a fullback with my hands, but I'm not going to stop that charge with a forearm shiver either. I'm going to stop it with a flat back and a low pad level and a good base, and I'm going to shock the blocker. But I cannot get off a block unless I have my hands in an inside position on the blocker. So I'm, I'm shooting for the armpits or the apex of the blocker, and I want to attack him with my thumbs up and elbows in. And I, I believe that drill is important to, to really getting a linebacker to lead with his hands. The next step is I'm going to fit the players up. I'm going to fit the offensive player leaning and higher uh, than the defensive player. The defensive player, as you can see with 31, should have a perfect fit. And I'm going to say lock out, and he's going to lock them out. I'm going to say lock out and then shed. Now here is a great illustration of two finishes. 31 is finishing low and square in position to make a play. He should not uh, thrust his body forward. He should shed, shuffle, and be in position to make a play as the ball carrier approaches the line of scrimmage. 46, as you can see, is not in position to make a play. He is not in position to change direction. So often in our drills, we, we, we don't teach finish. I think finish is critical because it is the most important part of the play, and that is putting yourself in position as a defender to put the ball on the ground. Lock out, reload, lock out, shed. And the lockout should be violent as I thrust the blocker backwards and gain separation. Again, if I don't have inside hand position, I can't get separation. If I don't have separation, I can't shed the blocker and get to the football. The next step in that uh, progression we'll get to in a minute. A drill I use, I've, I've evolved to using this pre-practice, is I really want to uh, allow that linebacker to take a good lead step and I want him to over-exaggerate his shuffle and buzz in the feet, quick feet, and I want to thrust the inside foot up on contact, the inside foot being the ball closest, the foot closest to the football. I want to thrust the hands forward so that becomes uh, automatic as I approach a blocker, and I want to have a good low pad level and be in position with a wide base to take on a blocker. The reason I have the bag behind the linebacker is oftentimes a linebacker goes backwards prior to going forward. I believe it's important, not critical, that you teach good habits and get a good first step because that good first step will allow a linebacker to close in on the blocker and the ball carrier uh, quicker without wasting uh, false steps. And then it will also ensure that the linebacker has a good base all the way through the play. This is a good warm-up pre-practice drill, and I find that by doing this uh, each day, uh, two to three times uh, per player, naturally they start stepping with the right foot. Like anything else, you develop muscle memory. The cage is helpful because it reinforces staying low. Uh, not everybody has the cage, nor is it always um, the most time efficient, you work four guys in a cage. If you don't have a cage, just work in the bag. Then after we punt or sh uh, shed the blockers, we'll, we'll actually attack the blocker, fit it, and lock it out. Another reason I like this drill is it's, it's not overly intense, 
but it can take a young player and over time develop that habit of keeping your eyes open on contact. So butting up a blocker, much like you see here, becomes an automatic for the linebacker and, and, and something he naturally does. A progression of stun drills will follow here. The first one I teach is we're working downhill working towards the football or shuffle shuffle stun we're finishing with a fumble recovery you can see the ball is left thus the linebackers 40 in this example will attack with their inside foot left how do you recover a fumble you bend your knees you put your eyes and both hands on the ball now one of the common errors in the stun drill is players are too aggressive uh, players will lunge when they attack the blocker and then their feet will come together as as uh, 47s did there. That is a good finish. Every tackler should finish in that perfect fit every time as 47 is. This is a change of direction. I progress from the downhill to a change of direction stun drill and, and I just tell them ahead of time where the ball is. Good finish by 16 on the tackle. Now they're going to shuffle much like you would in the course of a play. A little overextended by two. I want to shock and stun the blocker, take wind out of his sails. I like to have uh, somebody like 89's service, uh, servicing us so that we can actually uh, work around him and it increases my shuffle a little bit uh, better. We're attacking with the hands inside, shock the blocker, don't overextend, and finish with a good tackle. You can see we, we do this drill um, at least twice a week and I'll do a variation of this stun bill actually pregame. This is what linebackers do. They shuffle, they take on blockers, they shed blockers, and they work to the football and finish. And so as you can see here, we're going to do a fumble recovery. There's always going to be a finish to the drills that I do. Balls on the ground, as you'll see in some game footage coming up, it's, it's a natural uh, reaction for us just to scoop and score. 40's a little fast there, he wants to shuffle. He does not want to run to the drill. Uh, we, we want to shuffle to the drill, shuffle fast. The sled I have, uh, we, we, we won't always hit each other. Uh, th this sled's a good change up, it's a hit and lift sled where I'm giving a reaction much like a guard would give a reaction and they got a shuffle, shuffle, stun. And, and uh, you can see here um, that there isn't any fault stepping, nobody's stepping back, nobody's stepping underneath themselves. They're taking the right step. And then just to work them uh, in kind of a downhill uh, stun drill, uh, they're working in a straight line. More often on this drill, I'll, I'll work two at a time, and, and I'll give them the direction so it, it really teaches them and helps reinforce the, the, the good lead step, which is a six to eight inch step working towards the blocker. Some examples of a stun technique uh, or shocking a blocker in game footage. Thirty one is going to fit aggressively uh, inside and underneath a down block and hold his ground. 40 is going to stun and shock a blocker and be in position to, to get off and make a play. Forty five takes on the guard, stuns the guard, locks out, gains separation, shuffles back to the football.
45, taking on the fullback, hits, locks, sheds, disengages, gets to the football. Nice job by uh, 31, taking on the fullback on an ISO draw where we don't get a quick read. The fullback settles and attacks. We press it, use our hands well, and just naturally hit, lock, and shed, just like the drills we've done. Nice job by 45, taking on the pulling guard. 74, getting off the block and getting to the football. And again, if you'll notice, and when you go back and slow it down and freeze it, you'll see that more times than not, each of those linebackers is going to be in that same stance position we started with. 40 taking on the lead blocker, punch, fit, lock, and shed, and they should finish in the same position they're starting in and not deviate because that body position will give the linebacker the best opportunity for success. Another good illustration of 31, attacking the line of scrimmage and attacking the pulling guard, staying low and square. 20, attacking a blocker with inside hand position and shedding him. Both inside linebackers, 20 and 31, are going to attack blockers low and square. Uh, 20 uh, just has to hold his ground and, and fill a void. Uh, 31 ends up continuing to press the A gap, and together, low and square, they're able to reject the block or the uh, ball carrier. This is a good illustration if you follow number 40. As he pass drops, the ball is on the ground, and now he scoops and scores, much like the fumble recovery drill. Uh, that oftentimes we finish with in our drills. And when you do it every day or, or several times uh, a week, when the ball is on the ground, they just naturally do what they've done so many times before. Watch number 94, the left linebacker attack the blocker, lock out, gain separation, and shed to the football. Great job by number 40. If that ball goes through, uh, it's, it's going to get to the safety who's being cracked on. It's a nice job by 40 attacking, blocking, and shedding the blocker. 40 has contain here, but if he's not in position to shed and make that play, then it becomes number one's play, and I'd rather have 40 making that tackle than number one. As you can see, there are several illustrations of, of good stun taken on blockers techniques. And, and right there, I think 32 just had to uh, stand 
55 up. Nice job by 20, punch and fit and locking and shedding. Same thing with 94, attacking blockers, getting off blocks. That's what linebackers do. This is a good job of number 94 on the right side, attacking the blockers, punching fit, locking, getting off the block, and then ripping the ball out as well. Next section deals with defeating low blocks. I realize that in high school football, uh, blockers are not allowed to chop block defenders, although I would imagine there are times when defend or offensive players, for one reason or another, do go low on you and uh, this is how we defeat the low block. The first thing I do is I, I, I really want to just get them used to when that helmet comes low, I now have to take my eyes off the ball carrier and focus on the helmet of the low block. If I don't do that, that helmet will cut my knees. And, and I don't think those are great illustrations that you're watching, but what I want to do is I want to jam the helmet low and, and even if I have to remove my feet uh, from the blocker and give up a, a yard or two of ground, once I drive the ball carrier down into the ground, which I want to do with the helmet of the ball carrier, I want to work over the top of all cut blocks. Using the medicine ball uh, gives me an opportunity to play fast, get my hands down, stay square, and work over the top. You can see there's a ball carrier there and I'm working on finish. Then I progress and I, I work just an angle cut. Now I'll work a cut technique one day a week. And uh, I'll always do it and I'll do one of these variation of these drills. I won't do this whole sequence. I'll do a straight on or I'll do a pull or I might do one straight on and one pull. And here's a pull and I'm going to make an out call and I'm going to attack the line of scrimmage. But right on contact, as you can see, we're doing a good job of getting our hands on the helmet. I'm going to drive that helmet down into the ground and work over the top. Always staying low and square, always being in position to make a play. Chop blocks in games. You can see the back on the linebacker. It looks just like the drill we just did on number... 40, where the back's coming out of the backfield and attempts to chop the linebacker. 40 does a good job of jamming, working over the top, and pursuing the football. Right there, and it started with the shuffle. Guard trying to cut block number 40 again. 40 does a nice job of jamming the helmet down, working over the top. Actually, it's the tackle. The back trying to attempt or to attempting to cut. Number 31. Number 31 jams, works over the top, takes the quarterback on the option. Back trying to cut uh, the linebacker 31 in pass protection. 31 does a good job working over the top, does a good job of not leaving his feet. Defenders should never leave the feet. They leave their feet, the quarterback's going to make a miss and be effective running. 
you cannot be an effective defender if you're not a good tackler. You must tackle well. And, and again, I remind you that it starts with that perfect stance position. 47 is the player that demonstrated the stance at the start of the tape. Our, our, when we meet the ball carrier, our knees should be over our feet, our shoulders over our knees, head and eyes up. Uh, and and I, I would teach to slide the helmet to one side of the, the ball carrier, usually the outside edge of the ball carrier, or put the helmet on the football, not down the middle. When contact is made, I want to accelerate my feet. I want to tackle with my chest, not my head. My eyes should be to the sky. I want to bring my feet up underneath me. I, I want to either do one or two things with my hands. I either want to grab behind the buttocks of the ball carrier, which will snap the body backwards, or I want to club up through and climb his frame and drive him back. We teach both. Some players naturally grab behind the butt. Other players are more comfortable climbing the frame, and you'll see both on this tape. And then I always want to finish in a fit. Everything I do, I want to finish in that perfect fit. I never want my players to deviate from the perfect position, which puts them in position to make, uh, to take on blockers and make effective tackles. Uh, I, I like this mat tackling drill. We line up with the ball carrier one yard in front of the mat and the tackler a yard to two yards away. It, it does a great job of teaching a defender to keep his eyes open and his head up on contact. Tackling, it's difficult to teach the finish. This drill allows you to finish the, the skill of tackling and drive the ball carrier backwards and put him on his back. You'll see some uh, linebackers grab behind the buttocks and snap the body backwards and other ones will climb the frame. Every defensive position utilizes this mat at least once a week as we teach tackling. And we, we work some variation of tackling once, oftentimes twice a week. When, when the, the legs are grabbed behind the buttocks, you can see that the um, ball carrier snaps backwards. Now you'll see the same technique straight on tackles in game footage. Let's follow the ball or the, uh, the tackler 45 doing a nice job of shuffling and fitting the ball carrier up low and square. Missed tackles drive me crazy. Uh, we, we've only had 15 runs a year ago. I'm sorry, we only had eight runs over 15 yards a year ago against us. And our, our defense has been in the top ten in scoring defense the last three years. And I think a big reason is we've been effective tacklers. And, and I think missed tackles are a result of ducking the head, bringing the feet together at the most critical point of the tackle, and, and not being in an ideal position to make a tackle. And, and so as you can see here, uh, we do it play after play after play. And it all comes down to, again, body pet position and leverage. In the passing game, uh, nothing would change. It, it uh, really drives me crazy when I see defenders lower their head and go for kill shots. When, when you should accelerate to the ball carrier, but prior to contact, you should regain that shuffle in that perfect linebacker position as you meet the ball carrier, and that allows you to make uh, the best hit possible. You may um, knock some ball carriers out from time to time recklessly and ducking the head and putting the head on the ball. But I think uh, that form of tackling is dangerous um, for the tackler. And I think there's a high percentage of missed tackles by ducking that head. And I think you lose so much of your leverage and strength. As I critique my uh, player's performance at the end of the year, uh, I'm constantly uh, encouraged by how often uh, we're able to drive the ball carriers backwards. And, and that's a result of team pursuit and team tackling, gang tackling, but it's also a result of good technique. 
And, and so, uh, in particular, the last three years, our linebackers have done a great job of meeting that the ball carrier's low and square and driving them backwards, not giving up post-contact yardage. Angle tackles oftentimes uh, are more prevalent than straight on tackles. And an angle tackle um, just becomes a straight on tackle at the end of a pursuit course. And what I want to do here is I want to hustle to get to the ball carrier. Now, once I get to the ball carrier, I want to regain my shuffle. I, I want to work downhill to the ball carrier. And I want at the last minute get my hat across so as to not make a arm tackle. Now 31 does a great job but, uh, of regaining the shuffle. If I am out of control here at the most critical part of the play, the tackle, when the defender stops the play by putting the ball carrier on the ground. If number 31 were to cross over his right leg across his left, which players do in pursuit of a play when they're out of control, then that ball carrier will easily cut back across the grain and gain yards and 31 will miss the tackle. And the next two drills, the next three drills, are drills I use to overemphasize and reinforce how important it is to regain your shuffle prior to contact. And, and you're going to see as you slow it down, uh, some of the players do a better job of that than others. But if they don't regain their shuffle, uh, they're going to miss that tackle. 52 is a good example. You see right at the most critical moment, he's crossing his right leg over. Plus he is ducking his head. When you duck your head, you lose your strength. You, you, you lose your leverage. It's like kryptonite to Superman. Um, when you keep your head and eyes up and you tackle with the chest, you've got the full force of your legs behind you and, and you're, you've got a much better hitting surface. If this were a live situation, 52 would have missed that tackle. Now as we got ready for the the Orange Bowl after four weeks off, you're going to see we are rusty. Now 31, as good of a player as he is, he would have missed that tackle because his right leg is crossing over at the most critical part of contact and he does not have a good surface to make contact. You're going to see 20 is too high as he makes contact and did not get the hat across. Little things well, 40 was much better there. And we came in after this practice, watched these clips, and, and it, it's such a great tool uh, for the players to see themselves and say, you're right, we've got to get back to basics, we've got to get back to doing little things well. These are examples of angle tackles. After a pursuit course, regaining my shuffle, getting my hat across, and driving the ball carrier down. Again, as you could see in practice, we use the mat uh, primarily to teach this skill. I want to accelerate, I want to uh, close the distance to the ball carrier as quickly as possible, and then I got to regain my shuffle so as to not overrun the football and miss the tackle. Head and eyes up, tackle with the chest. Uh, the linebacker or the safety does a great job here, 18, 
working downhill. He pursues to get there. He regains his shuffle. All um, three positions, defensive line, linebackers, and safeties, uh, utilize these techniques in, in, in uh, how we teach tackling, how we uh, really uh, overemphasize regaining the shuffle, not going for the so-called kill shot. But, but making good, solid, fundamental contact and not giving up post-contact yards. Oftentimes a missed tackle, there's nobody else there uh, to make the play and you're, and you're going to give up valuable yards. 31, shuffling inside and, and making somewhat of an angle tackle.